Dear guests, for the next two hours, we will be having two sessions as part of the CEO Roundtable discussions entitled Promoting Growth Despite Instabilities. I would like to invite our moderator for the two sessions, Mr. Fadi Saab, Chairman and CEO of Transcapital Finance in Lebanon, onto the stage. Thank you. The first session of, of this panel is entitled Strate Strategies Facing Multidimensional Challenges, and our panelists include Paul Doani, CEO of Turk Telecom, Vasily Apostopoulos, CEO of Athens Medical Group, Magdi Hori, founder and chairman of Euclid Friends, John Sharp, partner at Hatchet Singapore, and Mustafa Baltaji, founder and chairman of Fintech Park. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to start by thanking you all for being with us uh, this afternoon, and to thank the organizers of the Bosphorus Summit for having arranged uh, this panel. The idea of this panel is that this is a beginning of a CAO roundtable um, activities that will be taking place not only within the one year anniversary of the summit, but also on a more regular basis, so that it's a platform for CEOs from different industries, different sectors, different countries to meet together, to interact, to network, to exchange ideas, and to do some business together. In order to make this a bit more of a, of a debate and of a discussion session, I would like to start by asking each panelist for a brief introduction of their background. And, um, and then we'll have a couple of rounds of questions and have enough time to go down to uh, the floor and uh, take your, your questions and your comments. Let me start with uh, Paul Dawani. Um, Paul, can you just briefly give us an, an idea about your experience and what you currently do? I have been uh, involved mostly in the telecom sector, and I have also, uh, for a period of time, uh, have done venture capital, early stage investments, and also mostly IT internet, uh, around 10 startups and 10 early stage investments. Also invested in uh, renewable energy, in geothermal, uh, involving some research and development in EGS. Um, I have been I come from an engineering background by uh, education, but pretty early on I switched into general management, and that's about it. Thank you. Paul, you currently run uh, one of the um, most prominent companies in, in Turkey, Turk Telecom. Um, and I wonder, uh, this is a question that's going to be sort of shared with all our panelists today, that there are a lot of challenges that come in your day-to-day -day business that go beyond the business model the activities of your company specific. Um, some might be relating to geopolitical situations or, or just unforeseen, um, unforeseen obstacles. How do you try to be sort of risk ready uh, to de-risk de uh, your, your activities and make sure that you're ready to overcome those obstacles that come around? I think in general, it's not that difficult in uh, sort of larger companies to have uh, groups of people focused on what should be done over a time scale, you know, quarter to quarter for up to 12 months ahead, mostly working on execution. Then we have people who are working a little bit beyond that, who are working on the newer things and under, let's say, strategy business development type. And also, we started a quote unquote like a startup. Uh, um, set up, uh, we established a corporate venture capital entity. Uh, so under our corporate venture capital entity, we're also now making investments. So what this allows us to do is to have people who are looking even five to seven years ahead. Uh, also some of our subsidiaries have been involved in uh, heavy R&D, that means at least five year investment. 
So uh, in the IT area, we have around 2,000 people engaged in that type of activity. Uh, so you have people really, let's say, the people who are taking the biggest risk are those who are looking five, seven years ahead. And then you've got the early stage type investments, those are really all very high risk. And then you've got, let's say, one year beyond the first year, who are mostly in like new products and services or uh, things of that nature. So are, they're closer to like what you need. An execution cycle is like 12 month execution cycle, and the rest are just focused on running day to day efficiently. And you know, large companies can operate this way, but so long as you have these tools, you know, you need to have tools where you're investing in the next stage. Uh, companies, I think, that do not invest in, let's say some level of corporate venture capital or at least engage in, some, in that type of activity or uh, make acquisitions in a, another way. But uh, without having that outlook, like that five, seven year and at least one to two year forward, then obviously uh, you can't manage your risk. That's the way we do it. Thank you. Our next speaker is Magdi Hori. Um, Magdi, can you please introduce yourself in a couple of words? Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Mike Yahuri. I've been um, investing in various um, telecoms and technology companies for the last 30, 35 years, and I've been uh, the CEO of um, uh, two operations. Uh, one of them was a telco, a um, competitive uh, telecoms company in France, uh, which was sold in 2009, and thereafter I was, I've invested also, and I'm still running today, Euclid Data Centers which is a uh, developer and a, a, um, uh, a, which exploits data centers uh, currently uh, mostly in France and Luxembourg. Good. I want to ask you the same question I asked Paul about the multidimensional risks that you face in your business. You obviously had two maybe change of careers, uh, maybe one related, one in telecom and the other one in data centers. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the kind of risk you face that go beyond your business model per se? Yes. Um, well, there are two, 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 types of, uh, two types of main risks, actually. One of them, um, if, if we talk about the data center's business, uh, it's a, the particularity is it's a, it's, it's a very capital-intensive business. So um, uh, usually uh, it's, it's an odd model because your um, your revenue is a very small part of your capex, and uh, you are re reinvesting every year something like 50% of your revenue um, into um, into more buildings or into, um, uh, into into more investments in existing buildings. So the um, the problem comes from the fact that it's the approach is a very long-term one. Uh, it resembles a little bit the um, real estate business but with a, um, with a technology component. Uh, so what you do today, which seems to be a, a good deal, uh, you need at one point in time to think, is it, is it still going to be as good in 15 or 20 years? And that's mostly uh, the, the, the biggest challenge that, that we have. Uh, another challenge, obviously, is that right now the company is looking at, um, at expansion beyond, uh, beyond the, 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 the French and Luxembourg borders and even beyond the European borders. And for that, we have the, um, uh, the usual, I would say, more classical risks of any business when it comes to uh, political st stability, exchange rates, and, um, and, and so on. Um, on. Before that, on the, on the, um, on the telecom side, uh, obviously, this is a, um, it's a whole different model. And the risk comes from the fact that you're selling billions of units at very, very, very thin margins. So, um, so you need to always create vo volume. And in certain market downturns, you find that um, a very slight uh, bend in your uh, volume production can be the difference between a successful and a, and a, uh, and a company that's uh, not successful. Thank you. Uh, John Sharp, who comes all the way from Singapore to be with us today. Uh, welcome, John. Can you please introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm John Sharp. I'm a, a partner at Hatcher Plus in uh, Singapore. Um, we're using artificial intelligence and a network of leading accelerators to solve some problems in venture capital. 
Um, my own background is uh, I was involved in satellite communications in the 90s. Um, I worked uh, as head of Asia for the world's biggest ever startup. We raised $1.8 billion in our seed round, uh, which I think is still a record. Um, and then in 2000, I started a cybersecurity company that became the world's um, leading provider, OEM provider of antivirus. And we sold our antivirus technologies uh, via Microsoft, Google, Symantec, McAfee, and a number of other brands that you guys have, um, have heard of. The network that we're building now does span the world. Uh, this is my fourth trip to Turkey inside of four months. I'm delighted to be here again. I love Istanbul. It's a, tr a terrific city. And uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, John. Uh, same question to you is about how do you overcome unforeseen uh, risks and challenges in a multidimensional world? Yes, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question for us because uh, we actually had a first fund of $20 million and uh, we're doing uh, uh, investments from literally formation stage to Series B and anyone here that's ever been acquainted with a startup knows that those are that the risks are quite profound. What we discovered when we we're doing venture capital, however, was that uh, many of the risks we felt were, were just, um, that they could be mitigated um, if we took approaches that many other asset managers take. Um, and the more that we looked at venture capital, the more that we just found that this was an asset class that was completely out of step um, with data analysis, with proper risk management, with proper governance. Everything about it, we, we didn't really like very much, so we decided to rip the book up, uh, the playbook up, and, and start from scratch and really uh, come up with a model that we felt would be a better approach to uh, early stage venture investing. So I'd say at this point in time, we're, we're kind of more of a solutions provider than, than a company that's worried about risk because we've spent three years and several million dollars trying to figure out how to, how to do a better job of coming up with a resilient model in venture. Um, and, and that model really relies a lot on having a large portfolio approach. Uh, many venture capital companies have a 20 company portfolio. Uh, my own personal company portfolio is about that size. It's, you're only 25% likely to make a profit on a portfolio that's 20 companies in size. Um, so we felt that uh, we would rather get into the kind of territory where we'd, we would be 90% sure of, um, of, of getting a decent return. And that's the area that we're playing in. So the combination of being very early stage and having an extremely large portfolio that's globally diversified and sector diversified is, is our approach. And that's how we're, we're handling the risks associated with venture. Good. Thank you. Uh, Mustafa Baltaji um, came all the way from Istanbul. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Mustafa, can you please introduce yourself? Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, many thanks for the invitation. Uh, as you said, I'm from Istanbul, based in here, even though we have this um, cross-regional business. Um, uh, well, I mean, my official title is FinTech Park uh, CEO here, which is uh, a consultancy firm also looking into investment opportunities, mostly into the financial innovation area. Uh, so uh, we work with uh, the, uh, the big players like banks, insurance companies, as well as capital markets firms in due respect. But we also have this other running business, which is um, a financial innovation hub. It is called Coop, uh, based on cooperation. So as I said, it's based in headquarters in Istanbul, but it also has some regional offices, and we have only recently expanded to Romania. But in the meantime, we are also looking into international partnerships. As I have just told you, I mean, we have signed an, uh, an agreement with Singapore FinTech Association, as well as with Beehive, which is the largest uh, fintech hub in Europe. So, uh, but our whole idea is to make sure that the community, when it comes to innovation in financial services, is there uh, around some uh, information exchanges. So, in the respect, we do uh, organize some meetups, some roundtable dis discussions, as well as summits. So, we do that uh, on a, a very practitioner-friendly, uh, uh, you know, manner, uh, meaning that we look into. Uh, the real uh, use cases as well as practices. Uh, so by doing that, we have these you know, industry verticals, starting with blockchain, uh, as well as open banking, as well as insure tech and wealth tech. And uh, only recently, we have also started looking into artificial intelligence. So in due respect, we work with startups, uh, very early stage, including very, very early stage startups, 
and we work with uh, banks and, and insurance insurers as well as asset managers. So, um, uh, so but we also have this accelerator and uh, we uh, have this focus on blockchain only very recently. So we have um, incubated two startups. So I believe they will be also quite an added value to the community overall since blockchain is a hype. So um, it was more than uh, an introduction, sorry about that, but uh, it is uh, what I can tell. Thank you. Uh, my question is going to be the same for you. You're a startup that helps startups. So uh, how do you uh, see those unforeseen uh, risks that come to add on to your business model, and how do you cope with that? Be a cliche if I also talk about some more market volatilities and imbalances here, because it, it has become the usual suspect, right? But uh, we need to look into uh, the community, rather, because there are lots of mismatches when it comes to finding, identifying the right ideas and matching them with the right uh, you know, partners and the right clients. So that has become an issue. Uh, it is what we see and observe in the market. And the uh, second thing is, uh, as uh, the imbalances you know, emerge uh, in, a, in a drastic manner, so corporates, they, they become more reluctant to um, uh, you know, invest more in the innovation um, innovation as well as the, the, the products and technology. So that might be a drag for, for, the, for the long term, even though we don't see much of it you know, in, the, in the short run. Good, thank you. Before I go for a second round of questions, can you please introduce yourself? And I'm gonna ask you the same question. Well, as uh, technically was part of uh, the previous uh, panel, uh, I would like to address a very short, uh, let's say, greeting. Uh, and I would like to focus on the issue of the uh, Greek-Turkish uh, uh, friendship uh, issue. I have to say a lot about, uh, uh, you know, uh, thriving in turbulent times because you know that Greece has been uh, under a severe crisis, but I think that uh, it would be more of value added if uh, I address the, the Greek-Turkish uh, relationship issue. And I would like, if you allow me, to do it from uh, the podium over there. Then, then Hang on, let me go for a second round of question and then I'll give you the podium. Okay. Hang on one second, if you don't mind. Yes, of course. Um, Paul, Turk Telecom is a provider traditionally of you know, normal landlines. Uh, technology has changed this company a lot and opportunities uh, have come uh, a lot your way. And now with the big changes in technology in, in this uh, specific sector, how do you see the future uh, of telecommunication? In one word, there is no future. <laughs> I'm just checking who's awake. Or, so <laughs> I think that we all have to accept uh, that every company has, has, a, has a life. And if you can, you know, if you can pick up the half-life, uh, of course, half-life runs forever, as you know, because you half the half and you never finish. But what that means is that in the scale of uh, the speed of development of technology is now even the cycles of, I believe, private equity cycles and everything are no longer viable. You know, there's no five to seven years for that type of activity. And I think one of the biggest challenges we have, but similar to Magdi's challenge, is this heavy capex. And in a heavy capex environment, the most dangerous thing is if you invest in the wrong thing, uh, this is one issue. The second issue is regulators understanding uh, how pricing and competition can work when you have this heavy capex burden and you are basically a regulated sector uh, and in a technology that's changing very fast. And I think you've seen recently, I mean, they just announced, for example, in Germany, uh, their 5G tender rules, which I think is a total catastrophe. And I think most of the sector believes that because that's going to lead into heavy wasted investments. I think Italy have had a similar experience in their last 5G tender. Uh, we'll see what other countries do. So not only that you're running heavy capex with your existing fixed line and your, let's say, LTE or 4.5G technology, but you've got 5G technology now coming, which is uh, extremely expensive. So what you license, one of our biggest risks, for example, going forward is what they define by way of coverage obligations. So uh, in that one, the Germans definitely overspect it, which means it will require even more capex in Germany. So 
Uh, here, what we're trying to do, I mean, the solutions we're trying to find here is we're trying to find a solution where uh, one operator makes the investment, uh, the bulk of it, and other operators make contributions in a manner that minimizes duplication and still al allows for healthy competition. And we're doing this in a certain CapEx contribution model against a long facilities leasing model, which is unregulated, commercially agreed, non-discriminatory. It means everybody gets treated the same way. You cannot favor one against the other. And on the pure uh, radio side, we managed to do one full active sharing with one of the mobile operators in the market, in this case, Vodafone. And again, they're changing their international strategy because the new Vodafone CEO is, was their CFO. And that is also indicating that most of these companies really need to be run by kind of like financial people. Uh, because most of the work you're doing strictly really is about managing the finances going forward. But just on the word of digital transformation, which a lot of people uh, see as a potential or a risk, I would like to use the word business transformation. As all businesses need to transform themselves, there will be an interesting opportunity for so-called telecom and IT companies to participate in, uh, in helping their customers uh, achieve their transformations. And I think through that there will be a lot of X as a service type uh, uh, world in which telcos may be able to be part of it. And if they, if they don't, then they would have expired their half-life. I think you may have seen that recently, even Amazon with their biggest success in their mind, he's also saying that you know, the company doesn't have a life forever. So what that means is that the people who are doing new things, of course, who take the risk, have a better chance of having a future, uh, but then of course they are running the biggest risk. And most incumbencies don't like to take risk. So most companies want to live in their, continue doing what they're doing, maybe in a better way. That's why artificial intelligence or you know, any form of artificial intelligence introduced into a company may simply, or digital transformation, may simply make it more efficient. But the question is whether they should be doing that at all, you know, whether they should be shutting down that unit or selling it. Or, so that's, that's, uh, that's in, a, in a summary, the way I see it. Yeah, thanks. Good, thank you. Magdi, uh, cloud technology has changed a lot how we deal with data and how we process data and where we store it. Uh, and hence the creation of your business, uh, which is uh, data centers. How do you see that technology moving forward? And what are the related opportunities for a business like yours going into the future, the next 10 years? So actually, the, um, I mean, of course, it's no longer a secret to anybody that um, we are in a world that's being digitalized at very high speed. Um, we are producing, obviously, um, much more data every day. And you keep reading those numbers that are exponential as to how much is going from analog to digital uh, in every single sector, okay? The, um, the only thing nobody knows for sure is um, which form is this going to, to take? So you're mentioning the cloud, obviously, and we've seen the rise of the Amazons and Googles and Microsoft Azure and, and all that. Um, those are definitely, um, you know, in, becoming the incumbents today with a particularity is that they've become so big that they would uh, offer you everything for nearly free um, and yet make massive investments to do that because they're getting their value somewhere else. So it's actually a big question for people like us to think, okay, so what's gonna happen next? You know, are they going to just open the doors to everybody for free and who do we sell to? Um, that's not really going to happen because at the same time, uh, it's being more and more obvious that um, they, are, uh, they are going to mostly, most of their business will remain within the B2C sector. Um, one thing that nobody really sees when you're into B2B is that most of the data that is stored in the world today um, is in uh, the video format. Okay? The other data, the business data, the, is, is really doesn't take much space. And there's still, um, uh, you know, there's a big reluctancy at the beginning for, obviously, um, 
confidentiality reasons for corporations to put that type of data within those um, hyper clouds. And at the same time today, there's a new factor which is a, a more of a, um, uh, I'm looking for the word, but like uh, the, 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 um, the national factor, the, 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 yes, the privacy nationalism, where, for instance, we're working on a, on a big project now in the, in the Paris region that has to store uh, education data as well as, um, as e-health data. Um, even for free, the French government will never uh, even envisage putting them at the Google or something like that. Uh, so so this, is, this is pretty okay, but if we're talking about uh, risk taking, what we really don't know today is what will be the shape of what we store the data on. Uh, is it going to be like a, a, you know, a little tennis ball that can contain what we, what we today put in a whole building? That's what we don't know. And, um, and the problem is nobody else does. So, um, so you, you keep going, and I think the key is to stay as much agile and, 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 and flexible as possible to be able to adapt to the new rules as and when uh, they come. Paul was saying something here, uh, which is when you're into those type of businesses, obviously you're, you're investing big numbers into, uh, into infrastructure as opposed to into a switch or something. And that infrastructure cannot be amortized over two or three years. You need sometimes 15 and 20 years to amortize it. So you're taking quite a big uh, bet here. And it can only work if you know how to be able to, with, to have certain flexibility so that you can, within those assets, transform them to suit the new models as and when they come. Uh, at one point in time, we thought that uh, the emergence of cloud will reduce our, uh, uh, will, will, will make our business decrease in size because it um, takes less space, less servers, less everything. Uh, that did not happen because what, it, um, what turns out is that in fact it's only a more efficient way to use your data and but the, but the amount of data continuing to grow, uh, you're still, um, it, uh, there's more and more density on our sites for the same kind of space. So that's, that's really it. Thank you. John, um, with white hair comes wiseness, and uh, you're obviously a wise person. You've waited until artificial in intelligence came uh, into play so that you have this company that uh, you have the computer do the work for you, uh, in, in pre-selection at least, and giving you uh, ratios and numbers to take a decision on. I'm going to ask you a question relating to governance. Uh, we've seen three recently very important uh, shifts in and major companies that have lost their CEOs uh, because of governance issues. Uh, whether it's uh, Abrash Capital that uh, had $13 billion uh, of funds under investment that uh, had misused money in escrow in transit between investment opportunities. Whether it's Ian Musk who lost his chairmanship role for making an announcement about his expectation about uh, funding coming in a bit too soon before that was in place. And most recently about um, Nissan situation that uh, has affected Nissan, Renault, and Mitsubishi regarding uh, their infamous uh, CEO. How do, you, how do you do that? How do you look into governance and the issues of uh, making sure that the companies you invest in at one investment a day, which is fairly impressive, uh, how, how do you cover that risk? That's a really great question. Um, because they're, they're, they're three very different uh, situations as I understand them, and I don't understand them deeply, but um, taking your question and applying it to startups, um, I think a lack of governance is one of the core reasons why startups get themselves into trouble or a misunderstanding of what boards are supposed to deliver or what they're supposed to deliver to shareholders and, and what they're supposed to deliver in terms of information sharing. One of the big problems that we see in venture capital is that everyone in venture capital operates within their own silo. Um, so I might have my own angel investments and, and a guy next to me may be a partner in a venture firm and someone down the road may be running an accelerator and someone in the, uh, across the border in the next country is, is running a government fund. No one's talking to each other, no one's com really comparing models, there's no standardization of approaches to governance. 
and to KPI reporting. And what we're trying to introduce um, through our initiative globally is to standardize things like data profiles, standardize approaches to reporting, standardize approaches to um, governance and to documentation. Um, there's quite a few initiatives out there. I think the SafeNote initiative has now been copied in many countries. Um, if anyone here is uh, invested in um, startups, and, and I think there's a couple of people on the panel here that are very familiar with the, the SafeNote, um, but it's a simple agreement for equity is what it stands for, and it's replaced a lot of the complexity in the way that companies are invested in and allowed a sort of common framework to, to develop um, across the startup scene. We'd like to see more of that develop across KPI reporting. That's what we're working on our side. Um, and of course, artificial intelligence can play a great role in this just as a general, pardon my French, bullshit detector. Um, at a high level, it can go in there and figure out what is being reported on, what is missing, um, and just create a situation where we can be made aware of the gaps and the founders can be made aware of those gaps before the board even has to know they exist. So th the last thing I'd end with here is that what we've discovered in our analysis of over 450,000 investments across 20 years, all of which are early stage venture um, investments, is that there's a lot more data available at a much earlier stage than most people assume um, with, when it comes to venture investments. And I would say, I would add to that by saying there's a lot more capability for good governance and, and, uh, and, and, and correct execution at the board level um, at these startups than I think people generally would, would credit founders with having. The, the thing that's important there that the, the investors have to insist, of course, and that being in place. So if you create a framework where that insistence is part of that framework and the documentation insists on it, um, you can do a lot better. Sorry, I'm going to insist one last thing. Um, we found when we did our first uh, 20 investments, uh, it contained something in the agreement where it would say something like, you, Mr. Startup, Mrs. Startup, you must report to us your financials at the end of every month. We found this was universally ignored. Um, and our conversations with almost every other venture group on earth has shown this is to be the case. People just ignore it. Now what we put in that agreement is we say, you will give us real-time API-based access to your accounting system. That gives us the ability to look inside, see what the bank balance is, see if everyone's getting paid, see what the burn rate is in real time. This is the kind of level of governance that we're moving to, and this is where the technology is a really great enabler for the next phase of how we manage and govern these companies. Great. That leads me straight into fintech, into Mustafa's uh, uh, area of expertise. Um, I remember, Mustafa, when uh, globalization fame became first, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, the buzzword, and people were saying, we're against globalization. We don't want globalization, as if they had anything to say with the matter. Same thing with fintech. Uh, although fintech sometimes is cooperative and not only disruptive, but you find that major powerhouses, especially in the financial business, uh, fin uh, are afraid of this new technology and what's impact it will have on the way they do business. How do you see that uh, in, at FinTech Park? And what's the effect of Co-op, your, your uh, other company that does training and awareness uh, and uh, support uh, in, in uh, the startup industry? Uh, how is that going? Well, uh, I can't agree more that there, there are lots of buzzwords as well as there are hypes. Um, well, even though I was driving by, you know, uh, prior to this event, so I saw around this, you know, Bahçeşehir University, someone uh, wrote a graffiti on the wall that in hype we, we trust. So um, I don't necessarily agree with that because hype is, uh, is a misnomer because uh, if, you, if you fail to identify the right opportunities with the disruptive technologies and disruptive products, that, that's, that's a big loser, basically. So uh, that's why we need to combine the right ideas with the right solutions. So I see many people, you know, looking downward at the moment, looking at their, you know, phones and checking out their, you know, social media, uh, uh, you know, handles and so forth. But in the meantime, through those phones, we can do a lot of things, you know. Uh, through a bank mobile app, for example, we can send money, we can make payments, right? And only 10 years ago, it was just a dream, nothing else. Today, we can do that. But for example, in 10 years from today, 
uh, through those social media outlets, we will be able to you know, send money in and out you know, without logging into your mobile banking app. So if that is a case, so there is this opportunity so we can change some stuff with it, right? That's how I believe in, in, in the change there. So it is, um, it is how we approach uh, to the market, you know, uh, through FinTech Park as well as uh, towards Coop. And um, uh, we, we do not uh, sort of discourage uh, uh, the people that come up with some, you know, um, you know, startup ideas, so on and so forth. But we also um, uh, we encourage them, but in the meantime, we value the expertise and experience with it. Because the right products and the right ideas do not always come from the early stage you know, startups. Because, because, I mean, I mean if, if you take into account a particular industry like financial services, which are subject to uh, regulations, you know, compliance procedures, so on and so forth, you need to have the experience, expertise, and the know-how. So um, that's where the professionals, you know, white-collar people, uh, so they, they uh, come into the play. That's where we encourage them to sort of come up with the right ideas. That's how we design our programs, our projects, even our hackathons in the respect. I mean, um, it might be another stereotype, but uh, Israel, which is a startup nation, so uh, if you look at uh, the, the, the average age of entrepreneurs, mostly for the fintech startups, it's above 40. So there is this reality behind that. So um, all in all, uh, we try to value the, 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 the ideas as long as uh, they are, you know, filling some, you know, uh, gap by uh, tackling some challenges. In the meantime, they come from, um, from expertise as well as from experience. So it is how we try to, you know, combine and strike a balance uh, around that. Great. Uh, before I break the momentum and, and uh, listen to a speech about Turkish-Greek uh, uh, relations, let me go down to the floor and ask if you have any questions for our panelists. Uh, we'll take three questions and then we'll uh, listen to the speech. You have three CEOs, chief experience officers, that I encourage you to ask questions about their experiences and anything that might be on your mind. Good. Floor is yours. Thank you. One second. One second. The volume is not on. Microphone. Ah, okay. I, I hope you uh, heard what I said so far. So, uh, we stand here at uh, the crossroads of the world, as historians have uh, diachronically uh, pointed out, and uh, so this is a strategic hub, which is uh, connecting east and west and overseeing the Bosporus Straits. I want to thank the organizers for the very kind invitation and uh, hospitality, and I'm looking forward uh, to reciprocating in Greece at one of our forums in Athens, Thessaloniki, or Delphi. So after all, our uh, historic countries both have the potential uh, to emerge as global superpowers in academic, conference, and educational tourism, along with a number of other strands from health, beauty, and wellness to gastronomical and religious uh, tourism. I will carry this entrepreneurship and uh, friendship award to Greece in honor and anticipation that we will work more closely together to help deepen this bridge between our business ecosystems, expand our cooperation, and grow further our map of synergies. This is the way forward and the path to an advantageous future by virtue of our history, geographical proximity, and shared seas. We share a common destiny. And equally, the responsibility of maintaining good neighboring relations. I believe that we have space for a decisive upgrading of our relations in the coming years. It is the win-win, sensible path and the entrepreneurial option to speak. I'm certain that we will work together more closely going forward to advance and help safeguard such constructive relations. 
I want to quickly submit my perspective for the future of European, Hellenic and Turkish relations and also to quickly touch upon the core prospects I see as president of the Hellenic Entrepreneurs Association and CEO of the Athens Medical Group, one of the leading private healthcare providers in the region. So it is no secret nor a cliche that we have tremendous bi multilateral business opportunities. Greece and Turkey, and by extension, our societies, have only to gain via closer, multi-layered bilateral ties. And it is no secret that we have had historically shared a complex relationship. Accepting the truth is a key part of progress and change. I therefore strongly believe that the future of Hellenic-Turkish relations passes through entrepreneurship, <coughs> through the establishment and deepening of our multidimensional business ties. I deem this is a crucial element for our confidence-building apparatus. Such a positive business momentum will be a positive catalyst for our bilateral relationship, and the time is ideal for such an intensification of our efforts. Both our countries are in need of an investment boost and we can identify areas on which we can begin working together with high value added for everyone. It was not by chance when the recent lira depreciation challenged the Turkish economy, many Greek firms quickly reinvested in the Turkish economy as a vote of confidence and hand of support. In other words, deepening our historic relationship through bottom-up, business-to-business approaches will have positive political spillovers of decisive value. It will provide our policymakers with yet another tool to help upgrade our relationship, which we can and should move from at times uneasy to friendly, constructive, and even strategic in the future. From a business angle now, allow me to quickly share my macro uh, analysis of the prospects for Greece. Last year, my prediction was uh, re reservedly optimistic, optimistic because I am an entrepreneur, uh, and reserved because I am a pragmatist. Nowadays, I am firmly optimistic. I strongly believe that it is time to invest in Greece, co-invest with Greeks, pursue smart synergies, partnerships, and build long-lasting collaborations. The country is recovering steadily, and with the right mix of vision, initiative, and perseverance, it can attend rapid growth. At the same time, it can offer significant return to sensible investments with the right partners. The Hellenic entrepreneurs are here to support and help fuel such investments and the acceleration of Greece's economic growth. And because in business, being specific is of great value, I will very briefly share a few practical ideas uh, regarding the ideas I see ripe for future development in the coming five years in Greece. Firstly, both Greece and Turkey are trying to diversify our energy models, adopting greener and sustainable ener energy. So I strongly believe that uh, there is a considerable space for co-investment, smart investment, and joint ventures in the field of renewable energy. The second field concerns shipping, logistics, energy transportation, and its shortage. So it is, in other words, the border field of energy we can work and build together to safeguard a more secure, stable, and advantageous common future. Thirdly, I would highlight real estate and tourism. Fourthly, I want to highlight a set of services uh, where I believe we can develop win-win synergies and uh, mutually beneficial business partnerships. These include cultural education and healthcare. Greece's brand in this important field is particularly well positioned to facilitate the establishment of high successful extrovert programs of huge benefit to all stakeholders. Before concluding, I would like to add that both Greece and Turkey are entering a new phase. For different reasons, it's we are both in the process of transforming our productive models. And this transformation concerns crucially the need to create rapidly jobs. It also involves the need for maximizing productivity across a number of sectors. It entails developing innovative firms that can offer high value added products, services on the globalized 
chessboard. Greece is facing comparable challenges with persisting youth unemployment, tremendous untapped talent and uh, expertise in the realm of the new technologies promising firms in need of strategic partners and international bridges and interestingly and promisingly a startup ecosystem on the eve of a massive wave of European and national funding. This is perhaps another key sphere where we can pursue smart partnerships and business collaborations. To bring our ecosystems closer together, innovate and invest in their development together, pull out know-how, pull our resources, share our experience and help our disruptive entrepreneurs break global boundaries together. By conclusion, I want to be pragmatic as I have been practical. I am encouraging the deepening of our cooperation, not because I am an idealist, but because I am a pragmatist. Because I firmly believe that through the deepening of our entrepreneurial ties, we can unblock and unlock a notable latent space for mutually beneficial partnership, win-win uh, synergies and joint ventures driven by common interests, akin visions, and the pressing need to move forward, embrace the future, and leave our respective pasts behind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would like to thank you uh, for, for uh, attending this uh, CEO session with us. In the interest of time, since we're running late, I want to uh, continue with the second session uh, in the CEO roundtable about SMEs and the way forward for SMEs. I want to thank our CEOs for being with us and invite you, if you want to chat with them at the coffee break, to catch them outside, and I'll ask the second panelist to come and join us uh, for, the C for the SME roundtable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Thank you to our moderator and the panelists for their interesting presentations. Post for Summit has planted a tree in the name of our participants.